Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks uh, CKDD for the uh, award. Um, so I'm going to talk about my thesis. The thesis is titled Mining multi Large Multi-Aspect Data, um, Algorithms and Applications. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of show you, guide you through some of the applications and the algorithms, and hopefully we all have a good idea of what I did uh, in, at the end of the talk. So what are multi-aspect data, you ask? And I'm glad that you do, because uh, <laughs> here's an example. So suppose we have three friends, and they talk to each other, and they talk a lot. Uh, in, addition, <laughs> in addition to the fact that they talk to each other, um, we might observe different means of interaction, right? So maybe uh, the Donald Skypes uh, Vladimir Putin more than he Skypes uh, Xi Jinping, and maybe because Facebook is not available in China, uh, you know, uh, the Donald and Xi Jinping need to sort of resort to texting or regular calling, right? So these um, different views of the network are actually very useful to us, and so these are different aspects of the communication. Now, let's see what happens usually, or at least one way to view the problem is you just aggregate uh, the, uh, all of the views of the network, and you come up with an adjacency matrix of the graph, which is sort of the friendship graph or the communication graph. And this is a matrix. We've all seen one. It's not scary. You know, uh, we've uh, decomposed one some, you know, once in our lifetime. Uh, but what's happening here is that uh, somehow all the different views are lost, right? So what, what's, what's going to happen with those multiple views? They might give us different intuition or insights on, on uh, you know, nuances of the communication, right? So maybe the fact that two people Skype each other instead of texting each other might be interesting to us because they might form a different community or a different type of community. And so somehow when we aggregate those, those views, we lose information and we really hate doing that. And so in, instead of losing this information, we, so I was thinking, you know, what is a good way to model these different views. And so one of the ways that is uh, my favorite, as some of you who know me, is using tensors. So a tensor, for, for those who may have not encountered one of these beasts before in, in the wild, is a multidimensional matrix as far as all these applications and my thesis is concerned. Uh, so in this case, we have a three-dimensional matrix where you know, each slice is a different adjacency matrix for each view. Right, tensors have been very, very successful in, in various disciplines, which is a good sign that this is a tool that you know, is, is seasoned and is, is useful. So they've been, they started out from psychology and psychometrics. Uh, they've been very, very successful in chemometrics, which is chemical data analysis, and signal processing, and lately you know, in machine learning and data mining. And so um, they, these are the tools of choice for the most part for, for these theses. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications part of the thesis, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the algorithms, and then uh, talk a for a few slides about what keeps me up at night and what I'm working on now and for the future. So um, let's take the multi-view uh, social network application. What are we trying to find? Or what is one of the things we were interested in finding in this multi-view social network? Um, one of the things we're interested in finding is those dense blocks of sort of subsets of people who talk to each other and perhaps under subsets of the means of communication. So perhaps we want to find a group of people that is tightly knit to each other and they maybe Skype and text each other. So these are sort of co-clusters within our social network or roughly, uh, in lack of a, of a better term, communities within that social network. All right? So this is what we're trying to find. And um, the tool of choice is the so-called CP, canonical or paraphyte decomposition, uh, that is, uh, as, as uh, Christos and I affectionately call it, the chicken feet decomposition. Because what it does is it takes a tensor and it breaks it down into a sum of these triplets of vectors. Each triplet looks a little bit like a chicken foot, so that's why we call it that. So each one of those triplets is a rank one uh, tensor, or approximately a block. And so each one of those triplets is going to identify one of those co-clusters that we're looking to find in our data. And so if you would really like to solve that, you would have to solve this optimization problem that basically minimizes the errors between the original data and the chicken feet that approximate the small blocks in the data. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. This is a, a very well-studied problem uh, that we're going to use and build upon. Um, now, an example of that is, uh, is work that actually we did with uh, Le Mans uh, a few years ago, 
uh, on, on using this decomposition uh, in, in a way that we lets us identify communities in a multi-view social network. Here, I'm showing you an example of a DPLP collaboration network where the different views are people who cite each other, people who use same uh, terms with each other, and people who author papers together. So this is, uh, if people sort of are tightly knit along those views, it means that they are they belong to the same research community. And you'll see that some of those blocks that I show here are maybe more pr prominent in different views, but each view reinforces sort of the structure that we're trying to find. And if we, um, perhaps if we aggregate the information, that won't serve us well. And in fact, uh, compared to two-dimensional baselines that sort of aggregate somehow all these different views, uh, this in label data, that turns out it doesn't work as well as when we are embracing the multi-view nature of the data and we use the paraffect decomposition, along with other things that I'm not, I'm sort of glossing over. Uh, but this is an, sort of a re encouraging fact that using those different views in a way, in a principled way, is helping us identify communities more accurately. Uh, now, another example where tensors might be useful is when we have time-evolving social networks. So let's say you had a stressful job, you're done, then you go on vacations, and then your friends posting on your wall or your timeline or whatever it's called these days. And these are incoming interactions. These are edges that come and go. So these different interactions are a dynamic or time-evolving social network. And so time is now a different aspect of the interaction that we observe. And so we can turn this into a tensor, as before, where each slice is a snapshot of the, the social network. And uh, here, what we can, uh, we're interested in finding is how a community evolves over time. Maybe a community is very active during the weekends, and maybe they, they sort of not, don't talk during work days because they work. Or maybe a community is formed um, after a certain amount of time. But also, this can help us identify anomalies or interesting events that might be connected with external sort of influence. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about this uh, using results, but I just really wanted to show this slide, so that's why I did that. Now, switching gears, here's another uh, really cool application we've been working on um, that is also um, involves multi-aspect data, and that's uh, neurosemantics. So roughly, suppose we have multiple people, and we show them different stimuli, different visual stimuli, like. Uh, this uh, image of a dog, this image of the airplane, perhaps we ask them a couple of questions, and we record the brain activity. Uh, you can do that using multiple methods. You can do it using fMRI, or which measures roughly the differences in blood pressure in the oxygen or, or in the blood of the brain, and so this is a proxy for measuring brain activity. Or you can do it using MEG, which measures the magnetic field of, of the brain. Right? So these are different aspects of the brain activity that we're trying to measure. And probing the brain with different stimuli is also uh, yielding different aspects of the brain activity that we're trying to capture. And so, uh, you know, the, the overarching goal of this project is to basically understand how, how the brain works and how it captures semantic concepts. For example, uh, does my brain and Tanya's brain react the same if we uh, look at the word coffee? Perhaps it does, but maybe does it work the same for everybody else? So um, looking at semantic stimuli, are there groups of people that behave differently, or are there groups of semantic stimuli that elicit the same reaction to someone's brain? So this is what we are trying to answer here. And uh, I'm going to uh, use a, a small example, building you know, bottom-up to the full-fledged application and show you some results. So suppose we have four people, and we have only three words that they see. Um, dog, puppy, and airplane. And dog and puppy, uh, you know, they're synonyms. So uh, I purposefully have the same exact brain scan that they produce. Um, what we do here is we take the fMRI brain scan, and we just vectorize the entire image. And each voxel, which is um, means 3D pixel of the fMRI image, is now a cell in this very long matrix here. And um, we can do things like um, take the most high-density voxel, so that's what we end up doing, so that we eliminate the noise. But now we just imagine that each row, uh, which corresponds to a noun, is now you know, associated with a few features, which happen to be voxels that are proxies for brain activity in their particular area of the brain. Um, now, you have multiple human subjects, and one of our goals is to understand what happens when we sort of uh, see everyone's brain activity and how it relates to each other. And so we would really love, instead of 
analyzing each person individually, uh, try to see if we can jointly analyze the brain activity. And so uh, if you haven't guessed it yet, we can form a tensor out of this, uh, where each slice is the brain activity matrix of each individual. And so we have a noun by voxel by human subject tensor. And uh, now, if we do the same thing we did before, we take the CP or paraffect decomposition, what we end up with is uh, each chicken foot or rank one tensor is going to have um, a pattern that singles out a few rows of the tensor, meaning a few of the nouns, singles out the, the most correlated voxels for those nouns, and uh, the, the people that mostly contribute to this particular pattern. And so roughly, the way you can interpret that is that this group of people, this subset of people, um, is, um, has an aggregate uh, high correlated brain activity that sort of looks like that. So this is a latent image. And uh, this is mostly contributed uh, by, the, by those nouns here. And so for the sake of the example, those two people really, really love dogs and puppies. And these are heartless monsters who don't. And these people really like airplanes. And so when they view the airplane, their brain elicits a reaction, and, and that's what we're he seeing here. Uh, and here, basically, we have a co-cluster of nouns, voxels, and people. And we can try to find brain regions that you know, are similarly activated for dog and puppy and similarly activated for you know, uh, airplane. But we're not there yet, because what we is we really want to find semantically coherent groups of, of nouns that elicit similar reactions. And we don't really have a notion of semantics yet. And so let's think about this sort of totally separate data set that um, suppose I go out and I ask, you know, random people that I encounter, you know, here's a, here's a dog, here's the noun dog, and here's a few questions. Here's a, a hundred questions that you can answer either yes or no or one to five, how much you agree or disagree. And in this case, we have questions like, is it alive? Um, does it bite? Does it fly? Probably or hopefully not. Um, and you know, all different um, semantic questions that describe the noun in a, in a human readable way. And so this is a very, very useful data set because what we can do with it is we can annotate our results. And, and this is, we're not restricted to this particular choice. We could have other semantic features if, if, we, if we can find them. So we can have co-occurrence statistics of the nouns with other nouns or other words. Uh, but in this case, we use this data set. And this is from different people than the ones that we have the brain scans from, all right? Now, we have those uh, semantic features. How do we incorporate them in our analysis so that we achieve our goal? And uh, one way to do that is the so-called, um, well, so we, we can form a matrix out of those nouns, right? And you see that the rows are the, are the nouns and the columns are the questions. Uh, now, you'll notice that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the rows of matrix and the rows of tensor. And this is a key observation here because what we can do now is we can jointly analyze those two data sets and help fuse information with, from both sides into our analysis. And the way to do that is a so-called coupled matrix tensor factorization, uh, which is a very self-descriptive uh, name for, for a method. What it, what it does is it decomposes the tensor same way as, as uh, we had it before, where we have the, the rank one tensors, the sum of the rank one tensors, and it decomposes the matrix uh, into sums of rank one matrices, which happen to be uh, you know, pairs of vectors now, because we have two dimensions. Uh, key here is that um, the, the A1 vector, uh, which is in red, is the same for the tensor and the matrix. And the A2 vector is the same for the tensor and the matrix, and that means that they sort of enforce the same latent clustering across those two data sets. And so what we do is we enforce those two vectors, those latent variables, to be the same in order to enforce the same latent cluster between those two data sets. And mathematically, we can do that by enforcing the variable in the two objective functions, the matrix and the tensor, to be the same. Um, and now what we've achieved is, as before, we have groups of nouns, voxels, and human subjects. And now we also have a set of questions that annotate our cluster. And so 
we, we, we have a cluster of similar nouns, and then we can go back and see, well, what do these nouns have in common? So what is this cluster about? This cluster is about you know, things that bite, things that are alive, and you can buy them. Just a few examples. And so by looking at that, we have better interpretability of the results, and we can sort of try to understand what are the semantics behind this pattern. Now, to give you some idea of, of uh, you know, real uh, data results, here is uh, one uh, particularly interesting pattern that we have from, from real human subjects. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the three out of the four modes of the problem or dimensions. I'm showing you the nouns, the questions, and the voxels. Uh, I'm not showing you the human subjects because it turns out, even though we're very you know, special individuals, uh, in those simple nouns, we turn to represent them very similarly. So the clustering was, was very uniform. But what's interesting here is that the nouns in this pattern are uh, glass, tomato, and bell which are small things. Uh, the questions are, can you pick it up? Can you hold it? Or you know, is it smaller than a golf ball, which is an already small item? And the uh, area that I've highlighted in red, in those red circles, is the premotor cortex, which turns out is an area of the brain that is activated when we are doing these motions, or even when we're thinking about those motions. And so this is very interesting, because this is entirely unsupervised. We didn't really uh, sort of tell the method, you know, where you should focus on the premotor cortex, because that's where, you know, the interest is at. But this emerged from the data, and the questions helped us understand and validate the semantics behind this, this region. And uh, the fact that it agrees with neuroscience gives us confidence that we can further use this model in more complicated tasks that perhaps are not as clear uh, with respect to neuroscience and actively help neuroscientists understand how the brain uh, works. And so uh, I'm uh, focusing on that in, in my current and future work, but I'm not going to talk about that now because we don't have really time. Just to recap, though, the applications, you know, I see tensors and multi-aspect data everywhere, and so there are a lot of them in my thesis. Roughly, uh, we have two classes of applications, neurosemantics that I just talked about, and social networks and the web, which is a nice umbrella for basically everything that you see there. Now, you can catch me at the banquet and we can talk for hours about any of those individual things, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, of the algorithms now. So, uh, tensors, as I said, have, been, have become increasingly popular in machine learning and data mining and data science. Uh, they're, they're very powerful modeling tools for multi-aspect data, but they come with big challenges. And two of them are being addressed, the major ones are being addressed by, by this thesis. So one of them is the fact that now we have big data, and so the size increases, and so uh, we need to have scalable and fast solutions for, uh, for those uh, algorithms. And chapters four and six of the thesis talk about solutions for that. Now, another um, deeper problem, perhaps, because it's harder to maybe always formalize, is model selection and quality selection, quality control of, of, of the analysis, uh, in, in, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit about after the scalability. Uh, but for now, let's, let's delve into the scalability and, and fast algorithms aspect of things. Uh, now, there's been a lot of work um, that started, pioneered by Tammy Kolda, the, uh, the, the Tensor Toolbox by Sandia Labs, that what it's doing is uh, it, it, it makes the following observation. Uh, most real data sets that we care about here at KDD, or many of them at least, are very, very sparse. And so um, if we exploit the sparsity somehow, we can actually work miracles in making things be much, much faster than when we do all the operations with the zeros. Uh, now, there's a long line of work. Uh, some of it, esteemed gentlemen Alex Mutel and myself have uh, been involved in. And you might hear a little bit about that after this talk. Uh, but all, and all this work exploits sparsity in different ways in making those algorithms scale. Um, but all this work uh, is somehow exact. All, what this work is trying to do is mostly trying to optimize this MTTKRP, as its friends call it, operation that is very nasty, apparently. And it's especially bad when we have very dense data, or we have all zeros, but we represent them as dense. But here, what I'm trying to say is, well, what if we approximate the computation? Can we do something fast, scalable, uh, when we approximate? And so here is a rough categorization of methods that use some sort of sketching or approximating the data somehow by reducing or sort of compressing its size and trying to achieve uh, speed ups. Now, 
This might not be complete. If you have a favorite method that is not made the list, please let me know. But this is roughly sort of the categorization of sampling, hashing, and compression. Now, sampling has been mostly used by sort of sampling random, uh, you know, sampling, uh, reducing the size of the number of non-zeros of the tensor by sampling entries at random. Uh, and um, there is uh, some other work that is using sort of sampling in, uh, in the a la CUR mode, where uh, what we do is we sample rows, columns, and fibers, and we recreate the tensor this way. Um, there's very little work in hashing uh, done by Animan and Kumar, and there's also very little work in compression, uh, one of which is chapter number uh, five in the thesis. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this uh, bar cube method, which is one of my favorite chapters of this thesis, um, that uh, I think it was the first method to try to use sampling in order to parallelize the computation. And I'm not going to go into the deep details because I know it's late, but I'm just going to give you the whole overview of the, of the method. Uh, so Parcube uh, appeared, first appeared in uh, ECMLPK-80 2012, and uh, the idea is actually very simple. So what we do is we need to have some notion of importance of the rows, the columns, and the fibers. In the social network example, we need to have a notion of how heavy of a Twitter Donald Trump is versus how heavy Twitter some other person is. And somehow this way we sample rows, columns, and fibers. So indices from the three respective dimensions of the tensor. And we do that multiple times. And every time we do that, we extract a small cube. And all these small cubes are now very, very small. And we can decompose them very fast with all, any of those methods that I just talked about in two slides ago. Um, we do that, we do that in parallel, and we can do that embarrassingly parallel. And in the end, um, making sure that we disambiguate things that might have been perturbed, um, we merge things back together into their original space. And because we've sampled a lot, what happens is that most of the locations, most of the indices are zero. And so what we get here is actually a solution that is very close to what the full, uh, you know, exact solution would look like, but also very, very sparse. And sparsity is really important also in the results because uh, it, it, it quickly gives us an idea of what is important in each particular pattern. We don't really need to threshold or select things, uh, you know, at will. Uh, now, does it work? So what I have here is on the, on the vertical axis, I have the relative error, which means that I'm just dividing the error the approximation error incurred by this method, so taking the original data minus the result and the approximation error is squared and everything, and we divide that by the exact algorithm's approximation error. Um, and if it's one, it means that they have the same approximation error. If it's larger than one, it means that we're this much worse than the other method. Uh, and the, obviously the, the, the goal is to be as close to the, uh, you know, the bottom left corner as possible. And you see that as we increase the number of samples, then we, we actually converge to just as good approximation error. And we do that by having 90% sparser results, which is really cool, because now we have same approximation without having to deal with the noise. Uh, now, is it faster, right? So that's what we care about, right? So what I have here on the vertical axis, I have, again, the same relative error measure. And on the horizontal, I have the relative runtime, or basically how much, how much faster is Parcube with respect to, to the full method. And what I do here is I have a relatively small data set because uh, it's fully dense and uh, we wanted to make it work on the baseline methods. And so that's why we're using a small data set. And we're using uh, eight uh, different cores, so eight cores in parallel. So we fix the number of repetitions that we were playing with before. Uh, each dot here is uh, the sample size, which you see as, as it uh, increases, um, we get better approximation. And in fact, in some of the configurations, we get a 100 times faster uh, solution, which is great because this is between, sorry, a day and a few, a few seconds. Right? So this is, this is a really encouraging result. Now, this has been downloaded a bunch by different uh, organizations in different countries. It was the most cited paper, ECML PKD 2012. Uh, the time of the thesis was 40 citations, now it's 96. So um, I think it's, it has, has had good impact. Uh, and it's one of my favorite methods. Now, because Tanya is waving at me frantically, I'm going to breeze through the rest. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the second challenge, which is model selection and quality. And this is one instance of the problem where, let's say we have a tensor. 
we found the decomposition one of the ways that I just described, and we have no labels. We don't know that Donald and Putin belong to the same cluster or should belong to the same cluster. However, we need to know whether what we have is a good solution to give to uh, my, you know, my social scientist collaborator so that you know, we, we don't waste their time. Uh, so this, one of this problem is how can I estimate the number of those chicken feet that I need to send to my social scientist friend so that you know, they try to interpret that and make good use of both our times. Uh, sadly, this is an NP-hard problem in tensors. In matrices, it's a polynomial problem because you, we can solve it using the SVD. But in tensors, this is a very nasty problem. And so uh, there's no, it's NP-hard, there is, there is no, it's not constructive proof of the NP-hardness, right? So we can't really find the, actu the actual solution yet. Uh, but there are good heuristics. So as I said, people in chemometrics have been working very, very hard. There's very smart people. Rasmus Bro is, uh, perhaps the, the number one authority in chemometrics uh, and tensors, and he has dedicated his career making tensors the de facto tool in chemometrics. And he came up with a very neat tool that gives you a quality measure given a decomposition and the tensor, which uh, ranges from 100 for perfect modeling to very negative for very, very bad modeling. And so what uh, we did in STM last year, won Best Paper Award, is trying to maximize both this notion of quality and the number of components we can extract with good quality, sort of yielding a multi-objective optimization problem. And it turns out that this solution works better than uh, best baselines there are, still doesn't work perfectly, and so this is a very challenging problem, remember. But this is a nice step towards um, getting a solution that is more accurate and more interpretable. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'm going to spend very little time on the future work. Uh, and just one extension of this problem is there are a lot of different models of tensor decomposition. Chapter number two of the thesis is a 40-page uh, survey that talks about all these models. And um, it's not clear which one should we use at each case. So for example, we can use Parafac to do community detection. We can use Tucker, which is another model, and Tina, Eliasirad, and Davidson have worked on that, where we can discover roles in the tensor. Uh, or we can use other funky models to, to do other things. But we don't know that a priori, right? So we need to do the analysis. We need to spend time understanding if it's correct or not, and then see if it's useful. So can we have quick and effective diagnostics that perhaps do on a single pass on the data and understand the quality? And if that's possible, then what are those diagnostics? Right? So this is one thing that keeps me up at night. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to acknowledge that uh, Christos had a lot of uh, generous funding during my, my thesis. There were a few uh, fellowships that I'm very grateful for. Um, now, I really need to thank Christos and my awesome committee. I need to thank KDD, uh, a lot of my collaborators, most of whom are in this room right now. And uh, with that, I'll just uh, take any questions you might have, either now or at the banquet.